Welcome to the Expanding Worlds podcast. I'm your host, Deborah Caldo. This episode focuses on the work part of independence. And obviously, I don't need to remind anyone of the stats around the level of unemployment for young people with additional needs. It's pretty rubbish. And I don't think it matters wherever you live in the world. It seems to be that employment rates are incredibly low. So I'm talking to Nico Shea, who's founder of Ignition Brewery, and he talks about how they started this business, which is helping young people with additional needs, their plans for the future and how they plan to expand and how they plan to use technology and how it will help them diversify the business and provide even more employment options. So although this is a South London project, what's great about it is it could be replicated and the ideas discussed could be used in other types of businesses. Importantly, it can be all done in an economically viable way. So this is about a sustainable business providing long-term employment opportunities. But actually, I think the main focus of what we talk about here is what work should really be for people with additional needs. There are some great organisations out there providing purpose, but listening to Nick made me start to wonder if purpose is in fact the same thing as work. This project is really about running a sustainable business and the people here employed in the business might have additional needs, but that seems to be less important than the quality of the product they produce. And the fact is that people are buying beer and who makes the beer isn't why they're buying that beer. I think quite worryingly, his experiences are that many of the government funded and charities, although aware of the project, have been less supportive of the project because they think it might be too risky for the people that they care for. And actually, I feel it's way riskier for my daughter to do the same thing every day and never face being challenged or never fail. She needs to fail to learn and she needs to try new things to finally find out what she'd like to do. And Nick suggests there's a real difference in the way the project is perceived by businesses as opposed to government and charity and social enterprises. The businesses look at the product, not who makes the product. And the government and charity groups seem to judge the project based on who's making it. And it seems rather bizarre that his experiences are that some of these organisations that he's come into contact with had much lower expectations of what kind of product that Ignition might produce. It goes without saying that these government-funded organisations, charities and social enterprises need to be driving the aspirations of young people with additional needs because it's often these groups who come into contact with our young people first when they start that search for work once they leave full-time education. This podcast is all about aspirations and what the guys at Ignition Brewery are doing is proving that employing people with additional needs can be part of sustainable, economically viable business. So let's hear some more from Nick. This week, I'm talking to Nick from Ignition Brewery, which is based in South East London. Welcome, Nick. Hi. Can you tell me a little bit about the brewery, how it got started, what you guys do? I'm a macroeconomist by profession, and uh, in my spare time, every Tuesday, I go to something called Tuesday Club, which is a disco for people who have learning disabilities. About 300 people are members, and we have about 250 a week, so it's busy. The big issue that you see over the last 20 years of volunteering is people want a boyfriend or a girlfriend, or they want a job. And... I'm not really able to help with the dating aspect of it, but I can help around the job. And so I thought, right, well, can we encourage employers to take people on from our from our club? No, because the first question everybody asked was, well, how many people do you employ who've got learning disabilities? And my answer was, well, zero. So I thought, right, what we need to do is come up with something that is labor intensive, fairly repetitive, because then once you've trained someone, it's easy enough to keep going. And then you can make a good margin on. So that's where the economic uh, aspect comes in, because we have to make enough money to be sustainable. So two options were uh, beer or moisturizer. And I decided that actually moisturizer was just too complicated. And so beer was going to be the one. So never brewed didn't drink much beer, don't know any brewers, no idea. So all I started doing was telling everyone that that's what we were going to do. So I leafleted Tuesday Club. So I leafleted 300 people and got five who said, yep, I'll come. And what was interesting was they were all people who have some support from the council, but don't. they live independently with their parents, much more willing to take a risk and come and do some brewing than people in supported housing who's uh, the, the charities that look after them. Like, no, 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 that's very risky. That's very risky. So we found a brewery who would let us come and brew on their premises. That took about six months. And we went and brewed some beer and we did it about 20 times and some of it was good and some of it was bad but eventually what we worked out was that actually it was a process that people could do 
So therefore, knowing that they could actually do the brewing meant that we had a model on our hands that was going to work. So what I then set about doing was saying, okay, we're brewing in this shared brewery. It's a nightmare because the hygiene of a shared premises. So actually, let's get our own premises. And that's why we're here. So you might hear the clinking of the bottles in the background at the moment. So this is a, a former day centre. We just took over a, a lease. We said, yep, yeah, we'll pay you rent and hope for the best. And we ripped out the ceiling, ripped out the floors, put in new drains, and then luckily a pub chain called brew house and kitchen who are lovely people said we'd like to sell you our commercial kit which they did for one pound so we got given uh, this amazing kit which enables us to produce 800 bottles a day uh, for one pound which is extraordinary so and every time someone wants to spend money on anything that costs more than one pound i remind us that actually that we got our kit for that so it's got to be less but anyway so then we've been able to get brewers involved with us we had two great brewers initially called michaela and rory now we brew with tash and what they do is really is to facilitate all the aspects of the brewing process so that our guys can then do it so everyone does so from the brewing it's the ingredients it's the mashing in it's the distillation it's the fermentation they do everything there are some bits which are more tricky but actually it, with supervision it's all doable and then bottling which is, is what's going on now is it's the capping the labeling the cleaning the filling and the boxing so they do the whole thing from start to finish because we, we don't we don't outsource anything it's all done by our team so that's really what we've been doing so from august of this year we are a new business you know we are not funded with loads of cash or anything like that but we have been lucky uh, but we're a new business so since the standing start in august we're now basically pumping out about a, it's about a thousand bottles a week which we're selling and our aim is to double that to two thousand a week and we are supplying pubs restaurants delicatessens and doing our own events as well which is then the final piece of the, of the thing which is we want to get our own bar because at the moment we're a bit hidden in the back and what we want is to be up front and saying here's this really amazing bar you can come to it but there's a bit of a twist rather than oh that's cute look what they're doing it's like no we want a really plush nice bar aspirational and that's what we we're, we're planning to do next so we haven't had any problem trouble selling the beer We've had no trouble selling the beer at all. So we sell to trade and then we sell to the public at these events, as I say, and, and all our money pays for the salaries of the guys. So we pay the London living wage to the team, our rent, and then for the brewer. And in terms of sales, there are three things. is the taste of the beer. That's critical. If you make bad beer, I'll be out of business. So we've had batches which have been difficult in our early days, been because we cannot afford to put anything out which is substandard so that's the first criteria second criteria is it's made in Lewisham that is a second kind of seller and then third is oh that's interesting who made your beer but in terms of actual sales it's, it's the taste which has then led to local businesses are like give us your beer great the more commercial they are the quicker it is because they just go that tastes nice that's at the right price point and it looks good I'll have it where we have struggled are other social enterprises and charities who do events or maybe run a bar or have a theatre thing because they are just so reticent to try. I think they just think the beer is going to be terrible. <laughs> and they just, they literally agonize over coming to taste our beer. And we sort of seen six commercial clients in the time that you might have one. And then, so recently I was at a thing and uh, an event and it was half charitable sector, half hotels. And it was a hospitality kind of linking the two. And what was stark is we, we they bought the beer for the event from us. It says beer on every table, all the hoteliers straight in, desperate to try it charity sector really really unsure rest and they were just like oh i don't know and you're like you think i just called them out i was like you think it's going to be terrible don't you and they were just it's bizarre anyway so we're all about the commercial people i'm afraid <laughs> why do you think i think it's going to be terrible i think there's an enormous lack of aspiration for people that receive care whether that's because they've got additional needs or they are older or whatever i think there is a real lack of aspiration and we provide palliative care when we should be providing um care that develops people and enables them to move on and do stuff so when you say they think the beer is going to be horrible mm. you think that's because someone with additional needs has made it yeah Absolutely. That sounds bizarre. It is bizarre, but, but I think, I mean, so the level of resistance that I face, certainly getting this brewery off the ground, you know, commercial breweries were like, oh, that sounds interesting. I see what you're trying to do there. Let me know how it goes. Can I help? Hence, we got our beer kit. But, you know, lots of other breweries have been really helpful. But the charitable sector have been very much, yeah, I think that could go badly wrong. It sounds very risky. So we're not going to be involved in that. But when when you're up and running successful, can you get our guys jobs? Which has just been a really strange thing. So I think, you know, we're just one team of people, but we can't 
I think we have to do something about challenging aspirations because you can hear them bottling now. They are doing that under supervision of Tash and they're, they're doing great. They don't need 17 people watching them. And I think it's just showing that actually there's capability there. It's just a bit different from maybe what you might expect it to be. There's, have you still got the same five guys that volunteered? Yes, yeah. Has anyone else asked to join? We have, uh, yes and no. So we have people that sort of want to come and so we're quite strict about joining because at the moment we're just we're sustaining ourselves through sales and it's tricky to take on any more but this is another reason for wanting the tap room is you know we need to be able to expand the jobs we can offer so a big issue for us is is that we want to be seen as a new small business so we are going through exactly the same issues as every small business goes through which is you know cash flow not getting any debts we don't have any debt which is great building up sales building up a reputation keeping your customers happy getting delivery things sorted out you know we are we are struggling if you like in terms of we are a new business in our first year of proper trade and what is really easy for us to be seen as is some sort of quasi government employment project that doesn't have to worry about sales or tax or anything and should just be able to provide 25 jobs so it's a really interesting conflict for us because we obviously want to offer jobs but are contained by the fact that we are a small business you know we, we give our profits away but we still need to make a profit so when you talk about expanding you talked about other job roles mm. How long do you think before you can expand into your... Well, so we are in we are in January 2018 and I want us to have this bar open for Christmas. And I mean, we, it just has to happen and it's my thing for this year. And, you know, we've waited a long time to find any sites and the classic is that two sites have come along at once. So we're just trying to sort that out. But what that would enable us to do, you see, is... is, is we can, the big issue for our team so far has been about reading, people can't read. So we can get everything on iPads, we can make it picture based. We can get tap, tap machines, which means that you can actually just put your debit card onto it and then that's the money gone. So there's no need to handle cash. So all these technological advances mean that actually service uh, jobs are suddenly really open to this group because you can just go tap what you want, there's your card, done. So therefore what I think what we can provide if we had our bar is well, we're suddenly gonna have to be open for, I don't know, 35 hours a week and that's a lot of hours to fill. We found the big thing that people want is part-time jobs. They don't want to be here five days a week. So actually, we could probably offer quite a few different jobs to a range of people and then help them to get into fuller work if they wanted or indeed, if we sell loads of beer, offer full-time work ourselves. Have you seen changes in the, the guys that work here? I have. And before I answer that question, I think the, the thing I would say is that one of the freeing things about selling beer and not having government funding is that you don't have to fill out an outcomes table saying, describe how this person has developed because I'm not, I refuse to do that. And no one ever asked me how I've developed anyway but the, um, but just the prospect of filling out a table saying their welfare has increased from 2 to 8 out of 10 you know who cares but in terms of the actual thing we do care about which is their, their real lives yeah we've seen real changes the example I'll give you is so one of the team very 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 alert to noises and crashes and bangs and if a bottle goes over it's and breaks, that's a huge, huge deal. And it's taken a year, but actually a bottle fell off when we were brewing last week, smashed, went everywhere, beer everywhere, and everyone, everyone was calm and just went, okay, that's fine no problem and that was a massive step forward because that just would not have happened a year ago but it was great and there was no blame it was fine the interesting thing that's happened is, is that the, the team themselves do not they're not friends so outside work they just they don't talk what you've got is a really functioning team who are out for each other look out make sure they're all okay and I think that's actually a really great model for work is, is you know you're getting on with people that you wouldn't necessarily choose as your friends and doing it brilliantly timekeeping's got a lot better and also just in terms of the numbers you know it used to take us two and a half hours to bottle it's now an hour and four See, brewing used to take it felt like three days but it was probably 12 hours but now we bottle and brew in one day so in terms of just actual speed it's really good and everyone's here all the time so it's if we you know it, it, from those perspectives it's been a really really good thing do you think it's a model that, that could be easily replicated I mean I realise that you've got given the equipment which yep. must be a massive Bonus. Yeah, it was a massive bonus, yeah. Well, is there a model that you can see being replicated? Yes. So what, what we're doing is absolutely ordinary. It's easy. I'm an ordinary person. Anyone can do this. And the model is you get your equipment. You know, you don't have to have what we have. There, there are cheaper models out there. But for a bit of capital expenditure and someone with some brewing knowledge and a bit of a risk assessment, you can totally produce beer and sell it. And I think the struggle I have faced has not been the process of doing that it's been holding being the first person to do it so that's been the thing the guys that you've got working for at the moment do you see them moving on to other jobs or this week or do you do you want them to stay with you or do you are you do you see them moving on to something else 
Well, I'm, I'm a helicopter boss, so I'm just, I just want everyone with me at all times and I can just see what they're doing and make sure everyone's happy. Uh, so, and I've got to get over that and let them graduate. So I, I, my hope is, yes, we will have people who, who go. There's certainly two of the team where you think, yeah, come on, you can, you can go and do this. I think we'll have really looked back on this moment as like an amazing time, you know, where everyone's sort of working together and doing really well. And then when people leave, it will be hard. I think we've probably got at least one person who will, is with us for the long term and that's fine because that's what happens in a lot of jobs is people stay. So it's a, it's a mixture, we'll, we'll base it around them really. Yeah, I'm just interested to know whether the skills that they learn from you will mm. then translate into say, maybe a, another hospitality business mm. or something similar. So yeah, I mean, so we would, they would be able to go and work in a brewery because they didn't know exactly what to do. My reticence is just around, it's providing the right environment for one or two who will not cope well with you know, say, and we're talking before about, you know, a noisy environment or people shout. If someone shouts at them, that our team does not enjoy that. I, I don't like being shouted at, but breweries can be quite boisterous places. And it's those kind of things where we just have to nail those things before they would move on somewhere else. With the waiting and the bar stuff, though, that is something I think we can really do well because there's cafes everywhere. If we can get people trained up in that, I think there's a lot more scope there because that's a bit of a, it's an easier to observe task and you can intervene quicker if there's a problem. Do you have much contact with the parents of these guys? Do they come in? Yeah, I mean, I, t I tip my hat to those parents, really, because they have been risk takers and they have said, yeah, all right, then, go on. You know, they've never gone to a brewery, but, you know, show me your risk assessment and hopefully it'll be all right. So they've put an awful lot of trust in me and said, yeah, all right, let's give this a go. And and there are things, you know, where if we do an event in the evening, I might not be dropping somebody off until half 12 at night. And that's quite a big ask for anyone. So they've been amazing and really supportive. It's interesting you're talking about risk because I get the impression with the charities it's a risk. Is it the safety risk with the charities then? I think it's a safety risk and I think it's also something about, there is something about enterprise and charities that just doesn't go together. And you see it all the time where people do applications for a gardening project or a whatever project, which is great, you know, love that. But there's never a kind of element of, and we're going to try and develop an enterprise. So we're going to grow all these plants and we're going to sell them. Or, and it's that professionalization. So we're not just going to grow a plant and sell it, but we're going to put it in a really nice pot and cellophane it and stick a ribbon on it and sell it for 10 pounds because that looks wicked. And there's, there's just that lack of enterprise because I think a lot of people go into the charity sector, myself included, uh, in my 20s, because you want to help. But actually, probably what the charity sector needs is some people who run businesses and know what to do. So then they can say, well, actually, you could probably double your money on that. Our gift boxes, three bottles, they just fly off the shelves instantly because they look amazing and they're £10 and off they go. And it's that kind of thing. So someone who can just think to do that. And I think that isn't really around in the charity sector very much. Yeah, because you mentioned before that you said the first thing was the beer. The yep, taste. yep. That's the most important, and who makes it becomes less important. That's right. Do you think that that's the, the model forward, really, rather than thinking about whether a young person has additional needs? It's what they can do rather than yep. what their needs are. Absolutely, and I think, you know, I I didn't know if the team would be able to brew because actually I didn't know how, what brewing was. So it's, just, so it's like okay, and and that's been a really good thing is by by tackling something that's completely unknown to me. We've had to work as a team, and that's exposed everybody's talents. But I think the conversations we have are very different to the ones that I would have at Tuesday Club. So at Tuesday Club, you're there going, you know, what can I do for you? And here it's like they're saying to me, where are the hops? Where's the barley? Why haven't you got that? I need this, and that's just a totally different conversation that. You know, I, I was unaware of having worked in this sector for a while. And that's the thing that's really empowering about it is, is it, it's just, it doesn't make a difference who makes your beer as long as it tastes nice. Interestingly for us, the more we go on about learning disabilities or additional needs, the less beer we sell. It's really interesting. The more you bang on about this great cause, people just, you can see them just going, mm, I just want a beer. Beer is a split second decision that you make. And you can, you know, I can think about beer purchasing choices all the time, but actually generally someone's just in a bar and they go, give me that. And I think that's always there for our kind of locus on our compasses. We just go, okay, does it look nice? Does it taste right? Fine, let's let's keep going. And that seems to be what's keeping us in, in good stead. I think once we expand, then I think we're probably ready. We've not done much publicity and stuff. So I think we're probably in a bit more of a situation to start then challenging perceptions and saying, okay, you know, actually this isn't a one-off. We've got loads of people that are perfectly capable of doing this. Because people are, they're absolutely capable of doing it. It's just about going, we can do this. There's not, there's not a problem that we cannot recover from, sort out or get over. And it's just a matter of working together to, to find th that solution. Thank you, Nick, so much for your time. Thanks a million.
key takeaways? Well, it is possible to create a sustainable business while employing people with additional needs. And we all need to increase our aspirations and think about what's possible. Projects like this remind us of what is possible. As always, if you could leave a podcast review, that would be great. And if you have any recommendations for guests or for topics you want me to talk more about, then you can message me on Instagram or Facebook at Deborah Caldo, or you can email podcast at expandingworlds.com.